Great. So we're in part three of our series on spiritual warfare. And I, I think all of us this morning as we, as we left home, there's something really important that we did. We, not that I think I know, um, we, we all got dressed, didn't we? Um, imagine um, ever leaving your house without actually dressing appropriately. That would be, that would be a terrible thing. Um, each day as we, as we prepare to go out, as we prepare to go about our daily business, one of the things we, we need to do is to make sure we, we get ready. And in getting ready, we, we put on the appropriate clothing uh, for that day. And, and actually, spiritual warfare is, is the same. With spiritual warfare, God wants us each day to, to be dressed appropriately, to be clothed in the right way. And uh, when, when Nathaniel made reference to Ephesians chapter 6, I thought, man, he should just go ahead and preach the sermon today because that's, that's the passage that uh, we are going to be looking at in, in our uh, sermon for this morning. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 6 from verses 10 to 17. Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, he, he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, hence its name Ephesians. He wrote it from, uh, from prison in Rome, and he was writing to a, a church in this place called Ephesus, which was a, was a key city in what was then called um, Asia Minor. It's uh, today Turkey, uh, western part of that region. And Ephesus was, was part of the, Asia Minor was part of the Roman Empire at the time. The Roman Empire was the primary military and political power in the world at that time. When we think of, of spiritual warfare, um, Ephesus is actually a really helpful place to think about spiritual warfare because the spiritual climate in Ephesus was, was, was really interesting and, and uh, was a heightened spiritual climate. If we, if we go to the book of Acts, to chapter 19, we see Paul in Ephesus. We see Paul getting to Ephesus and, and the Bible tells us that uh, God was doing great miracles through Paul, that the, the, the aprons and the handkerchiefs that touched Paul would be taken and, uh, and they would be taken to the sick. And just by people coming into contact with those items, uh, they would be healed of sickness. Uh, the evil spirits that were in them would, would come out. This was happening uh, through Paul in Ephesus. Um, we read that in Ephesus there was... Um, people that were practicing sorcery, uh, and they had these, these books where they had written their, their sorcery stuff in, and, and as, as people converted from their religions to becoming Christians, they, they actually burnt these books with, uh, with sorcery in them, with these magic arts that they had been practicing. We also read that Ephesus was where the, the temple of of Atermis was found. Uh, the goddess Atermis, her temple was there, and there was actually a, a very lucrative business going on in, in Ephesus of, of making shrines for this goddess, uh, silver shrines, and that was a lucrative business for the silversmiths that made those shrines. So a very active place spiritually. In fact, um, a very dark place spiritually. It was a community made up of, of Jewish people uh, and non-Jewish people. Um, there was a fairly strong Jewish presence there. We're told that um, Sceva, who was one of the high priests, he had seven sons. And as, as they saw Paul um, casting out demons and, and the power of God working through Paul, uh, these seven sons, they, they, they come to this, this guy and they say... Um, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out. And uh, 
and, and, and the guy turns around. It's actually the, the, the demon in him speaking and, and, and says, uh, Jesus, I know, and, and Paul, I know about, but who are you? And uh, very dramatically, the, 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 the demon turn on this, these seven sons of Sceva and they beat them thoroughly and they run off naked. And uh, the, the, the people are in awe of God's power uh, breaking into the city. This is the, the background of what we're going to read this morning. And, and it really made me think about Dar es Salaam and the spiritual climate here. Because Dar es Salaam is, is a place where um, we, have, we have witchcraft happening at a very high level. I mean, you just have to, you know, you drive down the roads and you see signs for uh, different kinds of doctors uh, uh, and who promise different kinds of things. Uh, uh, you know, mapenzi, nguvu uh, zagiza, and, uh, you know, and it's blatantly out there. It's just written and you can read it. You can phone so-and-so and they'll, they'll sort out your love life. They'll sort out your money life. They'll, they'll, watam tuliza mpenzi wako. You know, they'll kind of silence the, your lover and just make them like, you know, just docile. You know, there's just, there's this reality here in, 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 in Da that the spiritual climate here is also a dark climate. You know, we, 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 we're a modern city. A lot of modern stuff has come in. But the climate, and, and Ephesus was a modern city, but the spiritual climate in Dar is, is a dark one. The forces of evil are operating. And perhaps you have been, you know, you've been exposed to some of that as you have lived in the city of Dar es Salaam. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17. The Bible says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God." So I began by saying that we need to dress appropriately. In the same way that we came here dressed appropriately, there is a way in which God wants us to dress for spiritual warfare. And what He wants us to do is He wants us to put on the full armor of God. Because there is a spiritual battle in the heavenly realms. Given the type of spiritual climate that was in Ephesus, it's not surprising that Paul is interested in giving this church a firm understanding of where they fit in to the spiritual reality of their city and really more broadly what's happening across the world. At the beginning of his letter, if we go to chapter 1 in verse 3, he says, Praise be to the Lord, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So he begins his letter by painting this reality of the spiritual world. And he says that your position is one of being blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms. You are positioned with Christ in this cosmic uh, outworking of God's purposes across the whole universe. You are positioned with Christ in the heavenly realms with all spiritual blessings. And as he, as he develops this idea, you, 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 come, you come across this idea of this spiritual reality of what's going on across the world in, in other parts of the letter. But then as he comes to the end, he ends with this same idea. And, and, and while he started by saying, you are blessed in the heavenly realms, in chapter 6, he's telling us that there are spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. So you are positioned in blessing, but there is a spiritual war happening as you are positioned in that place in Christ. I find it interesting that just before Paul writes these verses that we're reading now, he writes about what happens in, in the home. So in Ephesians chapter 5, he, he describes the relationship between a husband and a wife. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Um, the relationship between children and parents. Parents, don't exasperate your kids. You know, raise them up in the way of the Lord. Um, kids, obey your parents. Honor them. Uh, he speaks about the relationship between slaves and masters, um, how they are to interact. And, and it's, it's striking that after writing about those family relationships, Paul then goes to speak about spiritual warfare. So the context, the context is this dark spiritual world where the kingdom of God is coming, as we see in, in, Paul, in Paul's ministry. But the context is also one of writing about the family, the home. And the reality is, there is a lot of spiritual warfare happening in the family. There's a lot of spiritual warfare happening in marriages. There's a lot of spiritual warfare happening with children. There's spiritual warfare happening in, in, in the way we relate with those who work for us and those we work for. And, and it starts by telling us this, this particular last piece of, of Ephesians that our battle is not against flesh and blood. So as we, as we go through marriage, as we go through parenting, as we go through these relationships, that, that, that's the context of Paul writing about spiritual warfare. I, I've had times, Trudy and I have had times where we've, we, we've had such strong disagreements. We've, we've had challenges as husband and wife. And, 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 you, and you ask yourself, is it just me, Sheshi, messing up? Or is it just Trudy messing up? And, and the truth of the matter is we are selfish, we are short-sighted, uh, we are proud, you know, that's human nature. We're all those things. So you could say it's those things. We are disobedient. We don't want to follow God's word. All of those things are true. And, and all of us need to try as best as we can, submitted to God, following the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need to try the best that we can to follow what God says. What does God say to you as a wife? Do it. What does God say to you as a husband? Do it. What does God say to you as a child? Do it. I mean, it's there, do it, right? That, that's a big part of staying on God's path. But, but, you know, beyond that, there is this spiritual battle. There are these spiritual forces of darkness that are out to destroy, that are out to bring chaos and confusion and discouragement and division. 
So as we think of these verses, I, I just want us to have in the back of our minds where the context is and to think about your own life, to think about your own situation and realize that the battle is ultimately not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. Verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. The Ephesians were not to rely on their own strength, but to be strong in the Lord. Their position as those who had all spiritual blessings in Christ meant... They were in the Lord, and because they were in the Lord, they were to be strong in the Lord. They were to find their strength not in their own ability. They were to find their strength in God's mighty power. They were able to access spiritual power from God because they were positioned in God. Those principalities, those evil forces in the heavenly realm. 
realms, I want you to be able to resist. And in order to do that, you need the full armor of God. And did you notice that he doesn't say, if the day of evil comes? What does he say? When? It's, it's not a question of, will the devil attack us? It's not a question of, will this dark spiritual environment that we find ourselves in affect us? It's a question of when it does. When the day of evil comes, we need to have the full armor of God in place. That the immediate context that we have is, is the family context. So our wrestle is not against flesh and blood. We need the full armor of God. So if, if, if husbands and wives are, are struggling, if, if parents and children are struggling, if, if, if masters and their workers are struggling, they need the full armor of God. Just, a, just another interesting observation about, about marriage. I just feel that God really wants to touch on this marriage thing. And I know it's a sensitive thing because, you know, I can look at, at my own life and say, man, I, as a husband, and maybe you, you can look at your life and think, oh, as a wife, as a husband. But I think God just wants to touch on this thing with his Holy Spirit. This, this area of marriage is, is probably one of the areas that the devil's schemes are so strongly working today. Martin Luther put it this way. He said, there is no estate to which Satan is so opposed as to marriage. There is no estate as to which Satan is opposed as to marriage. Of all the different institutions, estates, things that God has, good things that God has put in place, marriage, which is the foundation of society, there's nothing that Satan is as opposed. And I think there's some, there's some truth to that. Father, I just want to pray for the marriages here today. I want to pray for the husbands who are blinded, the wives who are blinded, and that, Lord, you would remove the veil. I want to pray, Lord, that husbands and wives would see that their battle is not against each other, but there is an enemy who's out to destroy, out to kill out to rob them of joy, out to destroy the covenant that they have entered into. And, and God, if they can see that, if they can see a bigger picture, God, that that would help them to, to get a perspective of how important and how amazing marriage actually is in God's eyes. I pray that you would bless every marriage here. I pray that you would protect every marriage here. I pray that Husbands would repent where they are sinning against their wives, against you. And wives would repent where they are sinning against their husbands and against you. I pray, Lord, that they would put on the full armor of God to stand. Father, I thank you that you love every marriage here. That you have a plan for them. And Lord, even marriages that seem to have gone far from you, far from one another. I pray that you would restore them. You would bring healing to them, God. You would heal them by your power. You would make them alive again where they are dead. God, that you would do a miracle in these marriages, in our lives, God. You are able because you are good.
His protection. And righteousness means this. It means that God sees us as being in right standing with Him. We are in right relationship with God. That's what righteousness means. And it's not something that we obtain by our own efforts. It is something that he gives. In Romans 3, 22, it says, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This righteousness is given through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus to all who believe. Now, why is this important? It's important because if we think that we make ourselves righteous, we will be open to the devil's attack. Because the devil will come and say, hey, listen, that thing you just did, it actually doesn't make you quite as righteous as you think it does. It's really not enough. But if you say, hey, listen, actually the standard of righteousness is not what I've done. The standard of righteousness is I've believed in God, I've put my faith in God, and he gives me righteousness. He makes me righteous. Then I'm, I'm secure. I'm safe in that. Now, of course, as we have this righteousness through faith by believing in God, we must take that faith and and apply it to our actions, that we act as righteous ones. But we don't start by acting as righteous. We start by believing and knowing that we are righteous. Then we can act as righteous ones because this righteousness is given by faith, not by your actions. 
Ephesians 6, 15, let's carry on. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Readiness is essential for a soldier. If you're a soldier, you need to be ready. You need to be ready for battle. That's a, that's a mindset, a heart posture of a soldier. It's a necessary attitude for war. And it's the gospel that makes us ready for battle. The gospel is about Jesus who was ready to come into the world and go to the cross and die for us. The gospel is about Jesus who came to destroy the works of the devil. The gospel is about this same Jesus saying, hey, now listen, I'm sending you out. You go out and be my disciples and be my witnesses and tell them the good news. Tell them that they can be forgiven. Tell them that there is righteousness. Tell them that they can find peace in me. Tell them that they won't be able to do it on their own, but I've done it for them. That's the gospel. And it's an attitude of readiness, willingness. I'm going to go out. And if we have that attitude of saying I am ready and we understand the context of being ready is that it's this message this incredible message that we are called to proclaim to the ends of the earth then spiritual warfare takes its rightful place in that context because it's about the gospel of peace it's about proclaiming the gospel message it's about going out just as Jesus went out and we go out with peace you know, a soldier who has peace is a very, very dangerous soldier. He has peace. He's not afraid. He's got peace. The peace of God. Jesus, our Prince of Peace, gives us his peace. So we go out with that peace as soldiers. We stand ready for battle because of the gospel message. In, chapter, in verse 16, it says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. In, the ancient, in, th in these ancient times, the way they fought is they would have the armies coming against each other and, and arrows were a big part of how they fought. And the arrows would be shot out with the aim of causing mortal damage to the other side. But what the other side would do is it would put, it would put up its shields and the shields would, would go up and those arrows would hit upon that shield. And as the arrows hit on that shield, the army is protected. The fiery darts, those arrows are quenched. Their power is extinguished. And that's what faith is supposed to do. It's supposed to be a shield against the arrows of the enemy. Dear friends, what does faith look like? Shield of faith. What does faith look like? I think faith is, is simple, although it's not easy. Faith is simply learning what God says you must do and doing it. That's faith. What has God said I must do? Well, then I'll do it. What has he said I must do? tomorrow at work. I'll do it. That's faith. What has he said I should do today when I get home as I relate with my brothers and sisters, my parents? That's faith. What has he said about how I should handle money? I'll do that. That's faith. Faith is hearing God and doing what he says. Faith is hearing the promises of God. God has made certain promises and living as though we believe those promises. God has promised that he will never leave me or forsake me. I'm going to live like I believe that. God has promised me that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I should fear no evil because he will be with me. His rod and his staff will be with me. God has said that he is my light and my salvation. I believe that. He will save me. He will be my light. Whom shall I fear? No one. He's the stronghold of my life. I believe his promises. It's hearing what God says and doing it. Every area of your life. That's faith. 
It's hearing his promises and living as though they were true, acting as though those promises were true. That's faith. That's how we are called to live as followers of Jesus. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the head. The head is really important, isn't it? It's, it's where we think. It's where we reason. It's where we, we learn. It's actually the place where repentance takes place. Because, because repentance is, is saying, you know, I'm turning away from thinking a certain way and I'm going to start thinking a different way. So the, 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 the head, it, you know, it needs protection. It needs this helmet of salvation. So what we think about salvation is really, really important. Because what you think about your salvation, that is an area where the devil will attack you. It's an area where he will attack us. So for instance, do we think that our salvation is earned or it's a gift? If we think that our salvation is primarily about what we do, how much we have to work, how much we have to try in order to earn it, the devil will come and say, hey, Sheshi, are you sure you've, you've, you've earned enough? Are you sure you've, you've actually done quite enough to earn your salvation? But if we believe what the Bible says, which is it is a gift, I can go back to the devil and say, hey, listen, it's a gift. I didn't earn it. God in his love gave it to me. So I'm standing on that. Even if I, I never do enough, I could never do enough actually because it's a gift. So I'm just going to trust him and believe him that he's given me a gift. And the fiery darts of the enemy are reduced because this helmet of salvation protects our thinking about what we are and who we are in Christ. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Yes, our sin deserves physical death, spiritual death. But it goes on to say, But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a gift. Your salvation is a gift. Is our salvation by works or is it by grace? Similar concept. Do we have to work for our salvation? Or is it just God's unmerited, man, I shouldn't put just before that. Is it God's unmerited favor that he decides, I'm going to save you? Well, if you think that it's works, I've got to work for it because that's what the culture says, isn't it? Tomorrow, you're going to work for something. You're going to have to earn something. You're going to have to make a life for yourself through your work. That's culture. That's not kingdom culture. Kingdom culture says God has given you by grace what you do not deserve. That's your salvation. And if you can stand in that truth, when the enemy comes against you, you can say, you know what? I'm a child of grace. It's by grace that I'm saved. That's what, it, that's what Paul says earlier on in this very same letter to the Ephesians. He says in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, amen, not by works so that no one can boast. What do we think about our salvation? Is it, is it trouble or is it ease? I'm a Christian now. My life should be trouble free. I'm supposed, I mean, I have all these blessings in the heaven realms, right? Every spiritual blessing. I should just be ruling and reigning in life. Everything should be simple. That's a misapplication of truth. We don't take one truth without applying all the others as well. Yes, that is true. But the world is a place where the devil, the prince of this world, the God of this age is at work. And we need to understand that. So that's why Jesus in John 16 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Trouble is part of this world. If we go through the Christian life thinking it is meant to be trouble-free, we will be weak. Wow. We will be weak Christians. We'll not be strong. When the enemy comes against you, you'll be like, yeah, you know what? This is confusing. I thought I'm not supposed to have trouble. I thought everything was supposed to be honky-dory, easy. No. 
in this world, dear friends, if we're going to stand against the devil's schemes, we need to know that our salvation comes with trouble. It does. It's only when Jesus returns that there will no longer be trouble. And the last verse for us today, 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. A sword is an offensive weapon that is meant to inflict severe damage. It's no wonder that as, as Jesus was resisting the devil, he used the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, to the point where the devil had to leave him. To the point where the devil, each, each time Jesus said, it is written, it was like a, a spiritual stab into the devil that inflicted massive damage to the point where the devil had to leave him and come back. And, it's, and the Bible says, look for an opportune time, another time to come back because the, the word of God was so powerful to damage the enemy. So we need the word of God. And I won't say much on the word of God because I spoke on this at length last week, but we need to be people of God's word. People who love the word, who are reading the word, who are memorizing the word, who have the word in us and we can recall the word and we can speak the word and we are in the word. Interestingly, uh, John Piper, as he talks about this passage we've just looked at in Ephesians, he says that actually the whole armor of God is somehow linked to the word. So if you think of truth, where is truth? It's in the Word. If you think of where we learn about salvation, it's in the Word. Where do we learn about righteousness? It's in the Word. So it's like, well, the whole thing requires that we are in the Word, that we are people of the Word. And this full armor of God, dear friends, I want to encourage us that just as we dress up every single day, we, we don't take lightly how we leave home every day. We take that seriously. That every single day we take seriously how we dress spiritually. How we prepare ourselves for this war, this battle which is real. That we would put on the full armor of God, His righteousness, His salvation, His gospel, His word. That we would arm ourselves with that. As we play our part in this cosmic battle that is happening across the world, here on this earth. And as we do that, God says we will be able to stand we will be able to stand against the devil's schemes. Shall we stand? We'll sing now. I want to pray for us before we respond in this song. Father, I thank you for every single person here. Father, I pray that from today we would make a decision to put on the full armor of God daily. That every day, Lord, this would be part of our lives. That this would be an integral part of who we are. That we would put on this armor, not just some of it, but the full armor. Your righteousness, your gospel, your truth. Lord, your salvation. Lord, that we would go out fully armed with every piece of armor, the shield of faith. Increase our faith in you, God. Increase our obedience to what you have called us to do in every area of our lives. Oh God, we can't do this in our own strength. We need you, Lord. Help us, God. Help us, Lord. We need you. Give us your strength, Lord that we would be strong in your mighty power, not in our own wisdom and ability, 
in what we can do in the mighty power of God. That's where we long to be strong. In you, God, your strength, your power. Help us, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.